Hi, welcome to Moore Park Presbyterian Church. My name is Keenan Barber. I'm the senior pastor here, and we are so glad you've decided to join us this morning, uh, this beautiful, bright Sunday morning, this really hot, muggy Sunday morning. We hope that you've already gotten your run in, because if you haven't, uh, it's just going to be a sweltering sort of day. But you are with us. You are with your cup of coffee, a glass of orange juice. You're um, just chilling in your air-conditioned house, and you're with us, and you're enjoying worship, and so we're glad you're with us. Um, we're going to start our time together uh, in worship together uh, in prayer. And so would you uh, pray with me? Lord, thank you for today. Uh, thank you for the opportunity uh, for us as a church to, to be gathered um, through your word, through prayer, through music, through the many different things that will happen uh, during our time together. God bless it all. Um, allow us to uh, let go of anything that might be distracting us so that we can fully uh, bring our attention and our focus to you, Jesus. So, and we ask it as in your name. Amen. As we do, uh, we sing. And so uh, we're going to hand it over to our worship band uh, to lead us in our first song. continue our time of worship today, uh, we have a couple things that we want to let you know that are happening in the life of the church. I did not, um, in our first segment, uh, introduce you to my friends here. This is uh, Sean, Bonnie, and I don't know why we're giggling, but we are, but here we are. Uh, I want to let you know that our, our last uh, spiritual formation class on Zoom, uh, this Thursday, 7.30, uh, Pray Like a Gourmet is the uh, book that we've been going through. And so our last class is this particular Thursday. I'll be teaching on that. It'll be on the idea of joining uh, in the work of God and uh, kind of moving forward in that. So I uh, would love to have you join us. If you haven't joined us before, that's okay. We sent out a link uh, to that particular uh, Zoom formation class um, this last week. And so you should have, uh, if that, have that. If you don't have access to that, uh, just email us um, here uh, in the office and we'll make sure to send that link off to you. So. Bonnie, you were going to tell us about something that's happening in Oxnard that's pretty exciting. Yeah, so our brothers and sisters at First Press Oxnard are uh, hosting an event this Friday, August the 21st at 6 p.m. Uh, it is a drive-in worship alive is what uh, we're calling it. It's going to feature um, our own Joe and Alex and other band members. Um, it's going to be a time of prayer and music and so it's a drive-in service and we have you um, come and you can bring your own grill tailgate it's a wonderful time uh, to get together it starts at 6 p.m. for more information on it just go to uh, their website 
And uh, yeah, it's a great time for us to get together and do things as brothers and sisters in Christ. Very cool. You know, um, you said a second ago, Keenan, you said we're, we're giggling, and I don't know why we're giggling. And I think sometimes maybe as you're watching this, you might see us laughing and think, why are they laughing in that moment? Why are they giggling? And the, the honest truth is, you know, we like being together, and, and we miss being together with all of you. And if you've been here on a Sunday, you know that we take very seriously how we worship God and how we pray together and how we study God's Word, but we also are a family, and we're a community, and we enjoy being together and laughing with each other. And even those of us that you see here today, we're not together much during the week either right now in quarantine. So if you see us laughing sometimes and you don't know why, it's because we're enjoying being together and we're, we're even in the midst of doing the work of God, just having fun and being together. So as we continue, I, I, just, I, I just wanted to say that. I just thought, you know, like it's, it's a good thing to know. Uh, so as we continue this morning, um, we just want to go before the Lord in gratitude, but also in petition with our prayers and uh, just ask that you, whatever you're doing right now, would just pause and take a moment and join us in prayer. Uh, let's pray together. Almighty God, we come before you today grateful, grateful for this community that you've given us that is your body, that is the church, and specifically grateful for our local church, Moore Park Presbyterian Church. We thank you for the community that we have, and, and Lord, we, we grieve that we haven't been together in a while, but Lord, we are grateful that we can be connected digitally and connected in, in different ways, though we've not been physically together for a while. And Lord, uh, when we think about communities being distanced, uh, we think about our schools, and we think about our students and our parents and our teachers and our administrators. And Lord, we recognize what a difficult and unprecedented time we are in right now. And Lord, though there are many thoughts and many opinions about how things should happen or, or what things should happen. Uh, Lord, at the heart of all this are the kids uh, and the teachers, and we lift them up to you today. Lord, we pray uh, for our children. Um, Father God, I, I think of my, my youngest who uh, came in and just, just cried the other night because she felt so much stress about what's happening in the world. And, and Lord, we know that's not unique. We know our our kids feel the stress and they feel the heaviness and, and Lord, they feel the, the isolation and, and Lord, we wanna do what's best for them. And so we, we pray for them and for their well-being. Lord, we pray for the teachers who uh, teach out of a love and a passion to see students grow and develop. And God, we pray for the stress that they're under and the incredible decisions that are being made. And Lord, we pray for their well-being, for their support. Uh, for a sense of peace in their life. Lord, for the administrators who are making difficult, difficult decisions, Lord, and the, the people that are in control of the government right now, uh, we pray for wisdom and discernment. We pray for excellent communication and heart. And Lord, we pray that whatever happens, uh, that we would be gracious and that we would be reflective of the character and nature of Christ in the way that we deal with uh, the situations that we'll see before us over the next few weeks and months and however long this is. So God, help us to be your people in the midst of this. And again, Lord, be with those who are most affected. Uh, may your presence be in their life and may it be a sense of peace for them. Lord, we thank you now. We praise you. We thank you that the church is not a building that we, the body of Christ, can be gathered wherever we are, that we can offer you praise and thanksgiving for all that you continue to provide and to give us. And that, Lord, even in this time of pandemic, heat waves, disasters in the world in Beirut and other places, even in an era that deals with torture and slavery and war, that Lord, we know that your hand is in this with us. We know that you watch over us and that you are helping us to figure out, to discern the way that is your way, the way that will help us to come to healing throughout the world 
Lord, we lift up those to you today who are suffering, not just in our own community, but throughout the world, for whatever reason, be it illness, be it grieving over the death of a loved one, be it victims of the explosions such as in Beirut, be it people who are captive, tortured, or Lord, people that are here within amongst us who are lonely, sad, and experience melancholy and sorrow because of the time that we are living in, this time of pandemic, Lord. We ask you to put your healing hand upon all those who suffer now in any way. We ask you to wrap your loving arms around them and to lift them up, to give them the strength and the courage to move forward, to lead them to the hope, the hope in you, your son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, we come together now as a body, as a family, as your children, and we pray those words that your son Jesus taught us by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now we're going to continue in our time of worship with our band singing Build My Life. song we could ever sing worthy of all the praise we could ever bring worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we need it for you Jesus the name above every other name Jesus the only one that could ever say worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you oh we
trust in you alone and I will not be shaken I will build my life upon your love it is a firm foundation I will put my trust in you alone and I will not be shaken holy there is no one like you there is no beside you open up my eyes in wonder show me who you are and fill me with your heart and bring me in your love to those around me holy there is no one like you there is none beside you open up my eyes in wonder show me who you are and fill me with your heart and bring me in your love to those around me Uh, Alex, thank you so much. That was just beautiful. And uh, we are so happy now to have uh, in the living room with us today, Joan Johnson. Welcome, Joan. <laughs> Joan is one of the elders um, of Moore Park Presbyterian Church. And just to start off the conversation, just for those people who may not know you, can you just tell us a little bit about you and um, your time here at Moore Park, what you've uh, done? I trying to remember I think I came here in 1998 or 1999 and my husband was Lutheran and I was Catholic and we ended up Presbyterian and uh, we have been here I've been here ever since cool yeah. Great. so Joan has been part of a team that has been working on a project for MPC for how, a while now yes yeah, three or four months three Five or four months, months. yeah and is this, is it live? Can we? It's live. It's live. So we have a brand new website, if you didn't know that, uh, mpclife.org. And you can go there, uh, maybe not right now, but you can go there and check <laughs> it out. And let me ask you, John, why was revamping the website important to you? Um, well, it's, it's where we're gathering. It's where we're gathering right now. It's the, even in not these unprecedented times, it's, it's the first doorway that a lot of people walk through, rather than walking in the doorway of the church, they walk into the, the doorway of our website. It's where we're doing ministry. Um, it's where you can get to know all of the staff, and, and I, I like to communicate, and so I wanted to communicate um, what our church is all about and uh, what Jesus' love is all about, and that's all there on the website. Yeah. That's really cool. I, I, I love that. I can't, I can't wait to go and, and check it all out of you know thinking about um, the quarantine in particular I just wonder how how this has affected your your faith walk that's not a small question <laughs> no but you know me I'm not gonna ask little things um, uh, you know it's I think they call it the corona coaster the corona you know, coaster. it's like up and down but Jesus stays the same so I've had some really, you know, hard days, and uh, and that's when I found that the uh, what do they call them, the spiritual disciplines or the means of grace. So, you know, if I'm worried, I try to remember to worship. I'll put on worship music and try to sing with that. If I'm panicking, <laughs> I try to remember like pray. You know, even if my prayer is just like, Lord, I'm panicking right now. Yeah. Um, if I am scared, I try to remember like, well, what kind of service could I do, or what kind of scripture can I turn to um, and then just trying to stay in touch with uh, Bible studies via zoom um, and then this was a this project really helped me too it was a way for me to serve the church even when we're not meeting here you know so 
Yeah, it was fun um, being kind of on the on the behind the scenes of the project, and especially with some of the videos we shot, getting to see you bring some of the unique giftedness and experience that you have into the formation of this website and this ministry through the website. And I, I wonder, in, in light of all that, you know, what do you what do you think it looks like, or or how would you say it, it is for someone to leverage? everything that they are, everything that they have for the kingdom? Well, another, another small question. Another small question. Also, what's your I favorite didn't color? I did this time, just so you know. Blue. Um, the, I was thinking like, you know, when they were singing I Surrender All, which is just a great song. It's, you know, the song is not I Surrender Some. It's I Surrender All. And God has given us these gifts. And so I'm, I'm a writer by trade. And um, so it was a way for me to bring that out to write the copy for the website and to use that creativity that God's given me. And um, I want to be clear, <laughs> it was a team. Um, you know, Bob Cusick is incredibly gifted in, I don't even know the terms, that's how untechy I am, but he's <laughs> a great tech guy and he, he built the website and, and then Jill, your wife, has gifts in, you know, video and editing and so she did the videos and Cami Fair and and Roy Smith, I mean, they, they've been keeping it going the whole time before this, and they were, you know, involved in it. So um, I think we were all bringing our gifts. And even when I'm looking out here, the people that people can't see, these tech people who have gifts, you know, the musicians who have gifts, we're, you know, God gave it to us, and we're giving it back to him. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. I mean, we're so glad that you're here and so glad that... Uh, You've been with us. Um, you know, as we um, look uh, now ahead to our time of message, we look to preparing our hearts and, and our minds for all that God has given Pastor Keenan to um, deliver to us today on his behalf. We're going to um, have a slide that's going to come up. The band is going to begin playing their next song. and. We ask you to look at that and consider what it means to you to leverage all for the kingdom and how that translates to supporting the church in its mission through the community and the world. Thank you, Alex. Take it away. song 
brave. You make me brave. No fear can hinder now the love that made a way. You make me brave. You make me brave. You call me out beyond the shore into the waves. You make me brave. You make me brave. No fear can hinder now the love that made a way. You make me brave. You song I think I need to have playing when I'm trying to get to that last mile of the race just to have that in my ears and have me pushing me forward and pushing me forward so thanks uh, for y'all and what you bring um, we're going to get into uh, one of the parables today but I, I wanted to uh, share with you um, that uh, a couple of weeks ago um, I was on vacation uh, and I was up in the the coast of Oregon uh, with friends of ours um, and I my family and I have been uh, to that particular kind of their, it's another family, it's their family's like kind of vacation home or whatever. Um, but the interesting part is I've actually been to that house uh, probably 20 or 30 times, uh, but maybe not 30, more like 20. Um, but each Martin Luther King weekend, um, I actually go there uh, and spend uh, th that long weekend with, uh, with five other guys. And um, it started about, about 12 years ago, actually. I was in a spiritual direction program and uh, one of the gentlemen in the program talked about this in incredible covenant group that he was a part of and that he had assembled uh, kind of a, a random smattering of, of friends of his and they got together uh, once a year and, the, and they kind of talked about their lives. They looked at scripture, they took communion together, did lots of things together. And I thought, gosh, that's the kind of thing that I want to have in, in my life. And so um, I sent out invitations to eight, uh, nine different guys, and I got heard back from five of them, and they said, yeah, we're, we're in. We don't really know what we're in for, but we're in. And as I prayed and tried to figure out what we were going to be doing together, uh, it really kind of, uh, our gathering sort of cent centered around the idea of, I thought uh, at the time, and it still has kind of uh, through all these years has worked out, to really ask the question, what does it mean to be a good steward of your life? And so... We um, sit together and uh, talk about, you know, our, 
marriages and our kids and our work and our physical health and any number of different other subjects. But the idea is um, we're going to ask the hard questions. We're going to try to drive each other to be better at all those things and, and really in the end to be re uh, better reflections of who Jesus is in our life. And so um, I think um, that uh, exercise um, that um, I kind of stumbled along um, has been uh, very formative in my own experience. And I think it uh, gives us a little bit of a picture of uh, kind of what this parable is all about as well. So if you would, uh, grab your Bibles, uh, go ahead and open those up. We're going to be looking at uh, the book of Luke, uh, the gospel of Luke. We're looking at chapter 16. Uh, last week we were in uh, chapter 15, looking at the lost and found parables. This week we're in chapter 16, and we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 9, um, and that's where we're going to begin. So uh, I'm reading from a translation called the NRSV, New Revised Standard Version. Um, whatever version you're looking at, there's uh, no right or wrong answer. It's just good that you're in the Word of God. And so let's read together. Then Jesus said to the disciples, uh, there was a rich man who had a manager. And charges were brought to him that this man was squandering his property. So he summoned him and said to him, what is it that I have heard about you, what I hear about you? Give me an accounting of your management, because you cannot be my manager any longer. Then the manager said to himself, what will I do now that my master is taking this position away from me? I am not strong enough to dig, and I am ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do, so that when I am dismissed as a manager, people may welcome me into their homes. So summoning his master's debtors one by one, he asked first, how much do you owe my master? He answered, a hundred jugs of olive oil. He said to him, uh, take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it fifty. Then he asked another, and how much do you owe? <clears throat> he replied, a <clears throat> hundred containers of wheat. He said to him, take your bill and make it eighty. And his master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the children of this age are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than are the current children of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of dishonest wealth, so that when it is gone, they may welcome you into their eternal homes. Let's take a moment and pray before we dig in. Uh, Lord, as we uh, continue to look at the parables, as we uh, wrestle with this particular parable, God, would you give us insight and wisdom so that we might know uh, what this has to do with our lives? And may nothing that I might say get in the way of what you would want your people to hear. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So uh, where do we look for answers to the myriad of questions that come out of this particular scripture? Um, in one particular bi biblical commentary, there were 18 different interpretations of this particular parable. And so what I'm going to do is uh, go through each of those 18 interpretations, about five minutes each, and then we'll see which one actually works out best for us. No, that's a really bad idea. We're not going to do that. Because um, I'm not sure that there's that many interpretations. But I do think it is suffice to say that uh, it's pretty challenging, uh, pr you know, uh, parable. It's, it's not as sort of simple and straightforward as something was lost and something was found, as we find in the three parables that are right before this in chapter 15 in Luke. And so, um, and then within the context of just parables in general, most of the parables lend themselves to a, an image or a picture that we can pretty easily sort of go, oh, that's what Jesus is trying to say. In this particular case, it's a little bit more difficult to discern exactly what he's trying to say here. So let's look at the, 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 the passage. It starts with this, uh, this manager. And he's, he's squandering his property. And it's really kind of the same language that's in the story of the prodigal son right above where the youngest son asks for his inheritance and he squanders it away. So there's this sense that it's connected to the earlier passage, really in this idea that there's some squandering uh, going on. And now uh, the rich man, and this is the guy at the top, wants his manager uh, to give an accounting of his management. What have you been doing with the uh, things that I put you in charge of? Um, why have you been dishonest? Why have you kind of squandered these things away? And finally, kind of at the end of the conversation, there's a sense of like, I'm done with you. He essentially all but fires him. So the manager thinks to himself, has to kind of step back and have a moment of reflection. And he kind of says, I, I can't do physical labor. You know, I got a bad back or, you know, whatever else. And, and I really don't want to beg. Um, and so what can I do? And so he hatches this plan. 
um, I will go to each of my master's debtors and I will reduce the debt that they owe my boss. And in doing so, I will curry favor with them. And if I curry favor with them, then when if I get fired from my job by the rich guy, then I might be able to go move in with them or they might actually look favorably on me and, and give me some sort of a job or, or, you know, they would take care of me in some ways. And so he goes and he says, 100 jars of oil will make it 50 100 containers of wheat, make it 80. Um, you have those kinds of debts to your credit card company, I'm sure. If you just sent them jugs of oil and containers of wheat, you'd be all set with Citibank. Don't try that. Uh, it's not really a good kind of way to go. Um, but <clears throat> so we, we, um, how would we then see how this all sort of works out? Well, let's really, the, the bottom line is, let's look at the books. Look at, let's look at the accounting. Let's look at the numbers, and it can reveal some things to us, right? We can draw some conclusions for that, but I think we have to understand Jewish law before we start there, right? Jewish law says you can't actually charge interest for loans that you make other people. And so probably what's taking place within the context of this story is that rather than saying, well, we'd had this amount, this is what you owe back to me, and then I'm going to charge you interest on top, there would be, uh, rather in the books, it would be just a representative, oh, they just owe me 100 you know, containers of olive oil. When in fact, a, a bunch of that might actually be sort of interest. And so there's a thought here that the manager knows that, the rich man knows that, and the manager knows that if he kind of takes that off, the rich man can't really do much about that because then he would actually have to admit the fact that he actually was charging interest. And so there's kind of some pretty, you know, as the word kind of gets to us in a minute, this pretty shrewd um, what this uh, particular person does. And so what happens then is, you know, it's, it's tricky. It, it's probably not above board, and it's really motivated by simple self-interest. It's all about himself. That's why the manager does this. He wants to make sure that he has some sort of uh, a safety net to fall into, and he's creating his own safety net by doing this. And as the disciples listen to the punchline of the parable, what they expect to hear is, don't be that slimy manager. Uh, don't be dishonest. Uh, conduct yourself as though you're representing the kingdom. And then Jesus lays it on them and says, and this master commended the dishonest manager because he acted shrewdly. And the disciples, I imagine, is sort of that if there was possibility in this particular time to have a record scratch, um, that's what would take place in this moment. It would be a, wait, what? You, you want me to be dishonest? You're, you're, the marching orders from Jesus are be the dishonest guy? Can you see how this parable can create some, some stress and some worry about kind of how to interpret it? I mean, we, we have to kind of figure out, we have to figure out how to clean up what Jesus said. That, that's, that couldn't have been what he meant. He, he must have misspoke. It, it must have been that when Luke was listening to the story, he was uh, drinking a too much, and, and he misheard things, or when he was writing it down, he just wrote it down wrong, or he got things mixed up. There is no way the conclusion of the story is, please, be like the dishonest manager. Be shrewd. And yet, that is exactly what Jesus commends in this story. And if, so if, uh, if God is commending the manager for being shrewd, we should probably get a better understanding of exactly what that word is all about. So the definition um, for this, the, the Greek word is uh, phonomos. Um, you can all say, no, sorry, phronomos. I said, forgot the R in there. Phronomos, because um, y'all, I know, I've gotten lots of emails saying, please, uh, bring us more Greek uh, to, to the services. That's really going to spice things up and, and really invite the, the, the threshold of lots of people coming and listening to the sermon. But I do think it's important to understand this phronomos word, that it's really, it, it, the, the translation would be practically wise, sensible, intelligent, prudent, uh, you know, and basically how did this person size things up and then use it for their own benefit in that way? Even in today's dictionary, if we were to look at dictionary.com, which I did because it's really sophisticated of me to do it that way, uh, quick, discerning, perceptive, um, sagacious, keen, discriminating, intelligent. We typically want to have some sort of a negative connotation when it goes to the word shrewd, um, but for the most part, the origin of the word, and even today, the idea is not as negative as you would think, that it's really probably more the fact that we're calling this particular character a dishonest manager 
that it gets to the idea that the word shrewd being connected with that would somehow to mean that he's doing some really kind of um, illegal or dishonest or not right sorts of things. So Jesus is saying be shrewd. W where else might this uh, come into play? Well, in Matthew 10, 16, it says, I'm sending you out like sheep in the middle of the wolves. And so be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Well, look at these two images that are, that are really would be to the, the reader at that time would have very strong implications. The serpent, let's be clear, it's nothing short of Satan. It's nothing short of the serpent typically represents you know, the Antichrist. It's not what we would want. It's the devil, right? That's the serpent. So there's a sense within this Matthew passage that we want to be as wise as the enemy and yet be innocent as doves. What does the dove represent? It? Well, if you look at the baptism of Jesus, we recognize that the dove symbolizes the Holy Spirit. That there's a sense that the Spirit of God is there. So it's that we want to have the cunning of the enemy and yet be gentle as the Spirit among us. That's kind of the imagery that's here. And so what, how does this practically then apply to where we are in our, in our own lives? I, I would kind of uh, put it down into sort of three movements, right? The first uh, movement is that there's a wake-up call that takes place. Give me an accounting of your management. As we walk this spiritual life, there are typically people around us who we have surrounded us with who can make us better, who can challenge the ideas that we have, who can say, you're not using all the gifts that God has given you. And those voices are asking the question, sort of, what are you doing with your gifts? How are you adding to the benefit of what's going on here? That's what this manager is asking. Sorry, this is what this rich man is asking the manager, but it's what we should be asking one another. There needs to be this kind of wake-up call to, you've been given all these different things. What are you doing to leverage them for the kingdom? And at the end, there's a sense here where the rich man says, I'm done with you, you're fired. So at that point, he could sort of give up, go home, and sort of say, I guess this is not going to work out. But he decides to reflect, right? He, he thinks back and he figures out... Um, how can I respond? And, and in some ways, what he's taking inventory of what he has. What, what do I have in my own midst that I might be able to use, that might be able to move things sort of forward? Let's be clear, in this passage, I'm not advocating somehow that persons uh, earn their way back into uh, Jesus' favor. This is not a salvation passage, right? That's not what this passage is about. The idea is God has given us things, and then how do we use those things in order that we might be able to expand his kingdom? And so we pause for a moment and say, for you, do you know what gifts God has given you? Do you know the resources that you actually have? Have you taken a good, hard look at your account? N not just your, your, your banking account, but your, your gifts account and where you have and the things that are around you. Have you looked at all those things? Have you looked at the neighbors that you live close to? Have you looked at everything? And now let's say that you actually know all that you have, and now the question becomes, what are you doing with what you have? How can you be a good steward of what you have, which then brings us to the question of this last movement of our response. He acts. He steps forward with a goal. He, he puts a plan into action. And I, I think in reading this phrase, and his master commended the dishonest manager because he acted shrewdly. This is where we have to be careful. We don't go astray from the interpretation and say, I don't think this is the point where Jesus is saying, please be dishonest in the way that you do the work of the kingdom. We, we have to be shrewd even in the way that we look at the passage to figure out what is he saying for us. And it really might be in the next verse that we get revealed to us really what he's trying to say. For the children of this age are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than are the children of light. You need to take what this guy was doing in a dishonest way and just put as much time, energy, planning, and work into the things that will happen just as much as he is. Now, let's be clear here. For looking at the imagery of sheep amongst wolves, the call is that you're the sheep, these are a bunch of wolves, you better be pretty bright and smart to figure out how you're going to outsmart those worlds so that you can get the things done that God wants you to get done. And that's the kind of cunning and the kind of keenness that we as the kingdom builders need to be all about. In, uh, before I started uh, working here at Moorpark Presbyterian Church, I was at a, 
I, I was invited to play golf uh, with Mike uh, Jankowski at Sunset Hills Country Club. We, we played with a couple friends of his, and we had really a, a great day. Uh, I don't really remember how I played. Um, I think I, avoid, I avoided any swear words, which is a, you know, a miracle on the golf course, but I'm pretty sure I didn't embarrass him too badly. And um, as we were done playing, we sat down to each, eat lunch together. And it's funny to think about the fact that you're eating lunch with someone is something you look back on with sort of a sense of like, wow, what would it be like to eat in a restaurant with your friends? But uh, I digress. Our conversation around the table uh, kind of landed on the topic of, of homelessness. And, and there was this sense that uh, we were sitting at this nice country club. These are pretty well-to-do people. And the problem is so big. And there's children involved, and there's vets, and there's mental health, and there's just all these things. It's such a huge, big sort of problem. And then I began to tell the story of Mary. Now, uh, Mary had uh, just left a place called Hope Gardens. Hope Gardens is a, a subsidiary or, or part of the organization downtown Los Angeles called the Union Rescue Mission. And Union Rescue Mission realized in their downtown setting was not a great place to deal with the needs of children and their moms. And so they, a number of years ago, started Hope Gardens. It's kind of in the hills in, of Los Angeles, a little bit away from things. And they house uh, about 150 people, a number of uh, just moms and their kids. Um, and the moms spend anywhere, uh, the families spend anywhere from 18 to 36 months um, in this location, they're getting job skills, uh, they're getting uh, therapy, they're getting hooked up with um, all sorts of counseling, uh, trying to put their life basically back together so that they might be able to enter back into the, the workforce and, and be able to sort of uh, make that transi transition back. And at a certain point, they have to leave Hope Gardens and they actually have to go to a place, it's Section 8 housing or an apartment, but they have to kind of create an, an, another environment then for them to move into. Now, the hardest part of this transition is the fact that there's a huge cost burden uh, to the family as they make that move from Hope Gardens to a particular apartment. Because if you ever think about it, um, if you start an apartment with absolutely nothing in it, there's quite a large expense in terms of just very basic things, beds and tables and um, you know, pots and pans and all those types of things. And rather than that person sort of spending all the savings they may have gotten um, on that, uh, I started to work with um, Hope Gardens to figure out how could we help within that situation. And so we kind of had this, this housewarming idea. So I worked with a number of families while I was at Beverly Hills. And since I've left Beverly Hills, I've worked with a couple of different moms to figure out how do we make that transition from Hope Gardens into an apartment? Because the statistics are absolutely staggering, wherein if you can make that little apartment feel like a home and feel like there's some sense of belonging, their success rate in terms of staying in that apartment for a long period of time goes like 70, 75% up simply based on the fact that they want to hold on to that apartment because it feels like their home. If you're sitting in an apartment with a sleeping bag and a lantern, it just doesn't sort of translate into like, if I lose this, it's not a big deal. So there's something to be said for furnishing that place, giving them a head start, allowing them to start with their savings sort of in their place. And I told this entire story um, at this, uh, this, this lunch, and I kind of got to the end of the, the story, and um, there was this place where I could have said uh, to this, this particular person who was sitting there, because I, I felt like they, I had them captivated, and, and I could have probably convinced him to sort of give me all the money I would need for the next project that we would do. $3,500, right? We could make the transition for $3,500. Give me $3,500. I can take this family, and I can make them actually, but I, and I didn't do it. And, and I kicked myself afterwards. Now, Mike is probably saying, I'm so glad you didn't ask for money at my country club with people I'm friends with. I, I get that. But that's part of what kind of what we're called to do, right? It's go for broke. The, the enemy's going to say, do you want a little bit more of this cocaine? Do you want a little bit more of this power? Do you want a little bit more of this? They're going to push the edge. And at some point, we, as the followers of Jesus, have to be able to push the envelope to say, I'm all in. You want to put money down for this lady, the next person who comes along, who's going to move into this place? Do you want to do that? I didn't do that. And I look back and I think, well, you're going to get another chance to sort of do that at some point, right? How does it look like then for us th to take um, all that God has given us and leverage it for the kingdom? 
God has, God has led us to live in a particular neighborhood. He's given us particular friends. He's given us certain, you know, spheres of influence. And what does it then look like to harvest those things for God? In some ways, if I'm able to see all the gifts and resources not as belonging to me, I can be free and see them as all gifts from God in which I need to leverage all those things so that the kingdom can be built and done that. And this is not just the perspective of the pastor who stands in front of you. It is the perspective that we, as followers of Jesus, need to have about all the way that we live our lives. Frankly, how do we start to see the work of the church differently as well? How do we begin to believe that God wants to do amazing and profound things in the work of the church right here and right now? So the next time you write out that tithe check, there's not this place of like, oh, I'm going to write this tithe check and it's going to hurt me and it's awful and I don't really like it. Rather than seeing, I get to write this check and I get to watch as the church enters into unbelievable ministry that can change and transform people's lives here in the city of Moorpark. We don't exist so that we have a legacy for ourselves, that we have a circling of the wagons where we just take care of one another. We have to be in a place of going out and making a difference in the lives of the people who are around us. We exist to serve the community. We exist to train up disciples that learn to leverage all they have to benefit the kingdom. And it is so much fun to see the legacy of service already existing in this place at Moore Park Presbyterian Church. I mean, it's that people are serving at Moore Park Pantry Plus. There's people who are serving um, as, you know, coaching high school kids at track team. There, there's those who are serving in city council. There's those, those who are serving on the student, uh, on the school board. There are those who actually put our entire website together to make sure that it represents us well. And so that's the place that people come in. They're not actually coming in those doors. The door is our actual front of our website. And how might that be so compelling that people would want to learn more and want to gather and want to be a part of that? The people who who are in this room right now, who are making this experience of worship take place because they've given up their morning and they're here to serve with the gifts that they have. What am I trying to say? The world, the people in the world will do whatever it takes to get ahead in the game. They will lie. They will cheat. They will scratch. They will fight. And as Jesus left us sheep amongst the wolves, we have to figure out a way to outsmart them. We have to be wise as serpents and gentle as doves. We have to learn their game so well that we beat, it, that beat them at it. That's what Jesus is trying to say in this particular parable. You need to be shrewd. You need to be thinking about the ways that you can make the kingdom of God come alive in your very little sphere of influence and how we as a church can do that as well. It's not for the benefit of our own little fiefdom or our own little kingdom, but for the benefit of the kingdom of God. And when we are all empowered by the Holy Spirit, bathed in the love of Jesus and directed by our mighty God, we will have a deep and significant impact here in Mork Park, in the Caneo Valley, and beyond. Let us pray. God, help us to see all we have all the gifts that we have to be used to bring for your glory. Help us to see the places in our walk where we might be able to, to do more. Help us to see how we might help people around us unleash the gifts that are within them. And in the end, when we're all finished at the end of the race, might we be able to look back and see that we left it all in the field. No regrets, nothing left in the tank. Thank you, Jesus, for all you have blessed us with. Now let us be a blessing to those who are around us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing together this last worship song, Thrive.
to know our Father's heart. Into the world we're reaching now to show them who you are. Joy unspeakable. What's the next line? Joy unspeakable, faith unsinkable. Keep going. Love unstoppable, anything is possible. Anything is possible. Well, I don't have to do the benediction. That is the benediction, right? I mean, that's the words that we want to hear. Um, but let me benedict us. Uh, I don't think that's a verb, but we're going to use it that way anyways for today. Uh, go, uh, people of God knowing that the enemy is going to do everything they can to possibly ruin the world. And we have been given the power of the Holy Spirit to go in, make a difference in the world, to change it for the good, and that we want to use every ounce of everything we've been given to figure out how to do that. So go, using those gifts, those skills, those resources to make a difference in the kingdom. Amen? Amen. Uh, I guess I would uh, follow that uh, by saying that if you are in a position where uh, you feel like you want to explore that more, you want to figure that out uh, more, uh, please contact me. Uh, let's figure out how that works in your life. Let's figure out how we can um, uh, release the things that are under your supervision, under your stewardship, so that those might be things that would be benefiting the kingdom as well. Um, we're going to spend a little bit of time right now uh, kind of uh, in kind of our family time. So if you're uh, new to the church, um, you're welcome to listen along. Probably most of this is going to be relevant to those who are a part of our congregation, but I think you can learn something about us as well by sticking around for a few minutes. So I'll call this a moment with the family. Uh, it might be the best way to sort of uh, label that, if you will. I, I heard uh, yesterday on a, um, a particular or read somewhere that what this uh, right, we're in right now is, is really a biological persecution. That, that in some ways, uh, because it is not uh, about governments or principalities or anything else, that there's a pandemic taking place. And in the midst of that, the church is uh, not persecuted based on, you know, those things, but that we have to figure out how to do life differently. And it's within those times in history where the church is persecuted, where somehow or another people become more innovative, be be people become more shrewd in the way that we might be able to do church 
And the church can actually thrive during those times. And so for some of us, we're kind of thinking, we've kind of figured out, like, I'm just going to sit on the bench and wait till, you know, time when this is all over, and then I can go back to doing what I was doing before. And, and I don't think that's the attitude we as a church want to have. We want to figure out how do we potentially get them back in the game in different kinds of ways and open up other ways for God to work. And so our elders met on Tuesday night. We prayed, we uh, discerned, and we really have figured out that uh, we want to uh, go about uh, the business of trying to partially reopen some of the ministries in our church. Now, I'm not going to get down to real, real specifics within the context of this, but it's to say that some of the ministries that we run, some of the things that we do, we think we're able to take those and shift them a bit, add some uh, additional sort of precautions to them, and that we might be able to move forward in those. Now, um, we're looking at each of those, uh, th those activities and trying to figure out, discern what those things are. And I would probably say this in terms of a general criteria that we're looking at. Um, one would be that events that are going to be happening on this campus, um, if they're happening, will be happening outside. Uh, we, all of the, the research that we've looked at uh, tells us that the risk of passing things along just goes way down when we do things outside. The second would be that everyone who is here uh, participating in whatever kind of ministry that we have, that you would uh, be wearing a, a mask while you do that. And then activities that we would uh, be able to put together, we would figure out a way for people to be six feet, um, if not 12 feet or 14 or 16 feet away from each other. Um, and I'm using some of those terms in terms of if we're actually in, in, in something outside where we're singing, we need to have more space in between us to be able to really make sure that we are keeping people safe in the midst of that. And that every sanctioned event then would have actually someone from our leadership who would be present to be able to sort of monitor to make sure that people are staying within kind of those criteria. And so, um, you know, to give you, um, and so what does that mean for, let, let me just go first to our, our corporate worship experience. Um, as it stands right now um, with uh, the, the, uh, the regulations from the Ventura County of Health, uh, Board of Health, um, we're really not able to meet in this room. We're going to be exploring um, some ways in a couple of weeks for us to be able to have people on campus gathered outdoors and be able to experience the worship experience together while looking at phones or whatever else. We would be doing the service from in here, but there would be people outside then who would be able to experience that in a way where they might be around one another. So that might be in a vehicle in the parking lot listening to an FM radio station and maybe watching um, the, the feed on a, on a video screen and maybe they're able to do that sort of... Um, on the back side of their car so they could see other people during the service and that kind of thing, but trying to keep people sort of separate. Or that we would set up a screen out here on the labyrinth um, and you'd be able to sort of experience the, the worship experience together. The difficulty of doing an actual full-on worship experience outdoors is one is financial. Um, it takes a lot of resources to be able to do that. Two, um, it's a lot of work, heavy work in terms of getting those materials sort of outdoors. Um, three, we can't control the heat or the rain or anything else. And four, our ability to really record a service of quality where we can communicate the message really clearly and effectively to people who still would have to remain at home really is diminished um, when we're outdoors. That's not to say that we're not going to potentially in the next few weeks or months look at opportunities for us to gather maybe on a weeknight, maybe on another night of the week where we might have a night of prayer, we might have a night of worship, and we would do that outside of the context of our Sunday morning experience. So we would still have that sense of being gathered with all the different criteria that I talked about before, um, but we'd be able to do that safely um, and be able to do that together. So other uh, activities, we're not saying, yes, everything goes back to normal, everybody can come on campus. We're really taking a very cautious approach where we're taking a few ministries, and for about the next month, month and a half, we're going to allow a couple of those ministries to kind of experiment with ways that we can do our activity and our ministry out of doors. And so our Renew ministry will be exploring how do we do that with junior high and senior high kids and a few other p people. So if you are part of a ministry and you want to see what's going to happen, we're going to meet with those leaders in the next week or two, give them a sense of what that looks like. There are some groups that we won't be able to have back yet, and they kind of already know that, that our CBS groups that meets is just too large and they take too much space inside to be able to allow them to come back. But there are other ministries that we're sort of looking at to be able to meet in a, in a safe way um, sort of outdoors. Small groups, we're going to continue to encourage small groups to meet via Zoom. Um, there are still kind of too many challenges to kind of get, but we can't regulate what takes place in your backyard. 
But the recommendation from us as a church is going to be those small groups should be meeting via Zoom. If you decide to do something else within the context of that, that's your own d- deal in terms of uh, being in your backyard. If you're going to do that, hopefully you do that in a safe way, but that's not our business to figure out how we can regulate what takes place in your backyard. Um, the office will remain closed, uh, actually. We are able to, to run uh, the business of the church um, while the office is still closed. Um, there are a couple of people on our staff who are in places where it wouldn't be safe for them to, to be around folks. And we can't really control who comes in and out the door and what kinds of things that they would be doing as they come in. And so um, we will continue to function as we have um, really brilliantly where every phone call, every uh, email, every bit of information that's coming to us, we're responding to. And I think we're able to do the work of the church with really no difficulty um, sort of as we do that. Um, I think that gives you a, a general gist that we're trying to take some baby steps forward. And I, and I realize that for some, um, they're still not going to participate in the things that are happening at the church, and, and that's okay. We're going to do what we can to uh, continue to do the things online that would engage you and allow you to have your, your um, spirit be sort of uh, filled and your, um, your own walk to be informed by the things that are happening. For others, we're not going to be doing enough. And Frankly, um, I, I'm, I'm not here to try to make everybody happy. If I tried to do that, I'd be dead soon, frankly. Um, but we're trying to do what we can to be really good stewards and to leverage all that we have as a church in this particular time, in this particular sort of environment where we want to keep people safe and we want to do that sort of slowly. So please continue to be patient with us. Continue to uh, show us grace as we're trying to make these decisions well. And continue to be in prayer for us as we do some of these things. Because it's possible still um, that as much as we're taking precautions to things, things can go wrong. We don't want to think negatively. We want to look and see the opportunities that we have. There are high school kids who are not meeting with anybody else. And if they were able to be safely on our campus to hear a message about Jesus, what an incredible opportunity we have in this time to be able to do that. So uh, I think I hopefully have answered all the questions that you might have. I'm sure that I'll get some other emails and I'll get some other things, which is great. Um, I want to be in dialogue with our congregation so that we're all together moving forward, trying to do everything we can to leverage all we are uh, for the kingdom. So thank you for uh, being a part of MPC. Um, Thank you for um, the ways that you've continued to engage. Thank you for the passion that people have about this church, and let's continue to figure out ways. And I think you're going to find out that in our next sermon series starting on September 13th, we are going to find all kinds of different ways to express the life of Jesus and really give you um, some opportunities to be able to take your own faith in your own hands and do some things with it. And so uh, pay attention to that as well as getting involved in a small group for that particular Um, session. I've talked uh, long enough, and I've probably talked faster than Donnie would have liked or that other people would have liked, um, but hopefully you're able to gather it all together. Um, MPC, uh, praying for you as a family, and uh, continue to pray for us as we discern how we move forward. Thanks so much for joining us for this little bit of family time, and uh, we'll see you uh, next week right back here.